today on the sixth day of World Mental Health Week, uh, we have privileged to invite our honorable guest speaker, uh, Birindi Beatrice Ma'am from uh, Uganda, East Africa. She is a neuropsychotherapist, researcher, lecturer, author, counselor, and a spiritual mentor. Today, she is going to enlighten us on a very relevant topic that is effective parenting beyond kinship. So, not taking too much time, now I would like to request our guest to kindly proceed today's session. Man. Thank you very much, Samyak. Today's topic is closest to my heart. And it is specifically about the bond and attachment between a child and a parent and how that is very crucial for mental health. We have different families. These children can be our biological children or they can be non-biological children. What does this mean? We live in this physical plane called Earth with physical bodies and we have forgotten who we are and where we come from and we forget that the body is the vehicle we hire to have a pilgrim on earth so mothers and children whether they are biological or non-biological we all belong to one kinship and that is divine kinship children belong to the heavens and children belong to the nations. As biological mothers, all we contribute is our DNA and our custodianship. So we all are spirit beings. And we forget that we were sent here for a particular mission and most of us unfortunately get out of this body without ever identifying that mission. Are we taking care of the children of the universe and the heavens? Have you ever asked yourself this question, who is our kin? Is it our biological family only? Or is it every spirit species in bodily form? We have identified so greatly with the physical form and the material perceptual game of the physical world that we have forgotten who we are and we do not see the divine in another spirit species in a physical body. For example, we no longer see the divine in that ailing beggar on the street. We no longer see the divine in the mad, mad old woman walking barefoot on earth. We do not see the divine in that neighbor with whom we are having a land wrangle. We do not see the divine in the colleague who belongs to another denomination. We don't see the divine in the prisoner locked behind bars, in that patient who is bedridden with a terminal illness in that Paul who is not our age, in that unmarried, infertile woman or man, in that widow unable to feed her children, in the widower staying alone in his house, in that co-wife struggling to educate her children, in that student who is getting low grades in class, that straight child, with a glue bottle stuck to his lips. That businessman who has been declared bankrupt. The abandoned child in an orphanage will no longer see the divine in them. This girl or boy with bodily deformity. This frail old man or woman. This child of a co-wife we consider as a stepchild. All these categories of people, I'm sure they have children of their own 
and children of their own must be going through some issues mentally because they have not received that attachment and that bonding to this man or woman who has his own or her own unmet needs. It is possible to look beyond the biological body kinship to look beyond denominations, to look beyond class, caste, gender, and social status, and see the divine in the other person. Remember, we have to get into divine kinship and live in harmony with our spirit kindred. This requires compassion for the marginalized, for the disabled, for the sick, for those incarcerated. And we empathize with the leper, the woman with hemorrhage, the beggar and the madman, and be friendly to our core wives and nurture those children that are not biologically related to us. This is our mission as parents on this planet Earth, whether these children are ours biologically or otherwise. And the world can be a better place if we identified less with the material perception game of things, situations, people and places, and instead looked at situations, people and conditions from a divine place where we see the divine in every spirit species who is taking on bodily form right now, still here on this planet Earth. So are we ready to play the material perception game to our advantage and see the divine in each people, in the places and situations and circumstances that we meet? if we are to keep ourselves mentally healthy? Are we ready for effective parenting beyond kinship? Children belong to the heavens. They belong to the universe. Children belong to the kingdom of love. Biological mothers give them the genetics. This means that biological and non-biological mothers are custodians of children when they are on this physical plane in physical bodies. We ourselves were once children. When we were ready to take physical form on a physical planet as our mothers over met the dad's sperm, there was a star burst in the heavens and those souls that were ready to match the vibration of the physical family in which we are going to be born into got into that DNA of the father and mother. And it was already encoded in the blueprint of these souls to choose to stay with the biological family or leave the physical plane or connect with other soul parents who are destined to bond with them beyond the biological relationship. This bond of love emanates from the heart. Maternal love transcends biology. It's an emotion of the heart. A mother is not defined by biology. She is defined by love. This is a mother by heart, not a mother by blood. We do not need to carry a child in our womb to become a mother. But to have a heart full of love and a spirit full of kindness. We don't need to carry a child in our womb to become a mother, but to have a heart full of love and a spirit full of kindness. Mothers are not just those who have given birth, but also those who have given their hearts and souls to raise a child. A mother is not only someone who carried a child in her womb, but also someone who cares for that child in her heart. We are born of love. 
Love is our mother, according to Rumi. And a bond of love is from the heart. And love makes a mother, not biology. When it comes to love, biology is just a small part of the equation. Love is not limited by biology or genetics. Many people from deep, many people form deep emotional bonds with children who are not related to them by blood or adoption. And the love between a parent and a child is not limited to blood relations. Love is an emotion that grows and develops over time. Parent-child bonding and attachment is an important aspect of raising a child, regardless of whether the child is biological or not, because it has a lot to do with the child's later emotional, social, and mental well-being. So the relationship between a non-biological mother and her child can be just as strong as any other parent-child relationship. A mother is not defined by the way she gives birth, but the way, by the way she loves and nurtures the child she is blessed with. Let us now go to the slide that has the content that we are going to be looking at today. And our content today, we are looking at neuroscience of material bond and mental health. Our second topic will be, is it possible to bond with a child who's not born to us? Our third topic today will be the science of parental love and love reciprocation. Our fourth topic is going to be the love bond between a child and a non-biological mother. And the last topic will be the power of touch for this baby. As we go to the slide of our first topic, the neuroscience of maternal attachment and mental health. You can see two pictures there. It shows one picture where a mother and a child are in that emotional dance and there is that flow of energy between them and the child is happy. And you look at the other picture where the child, his eyes or her eyes are looking down. She looks fallen as she is being rebuked or punished by the mother. Parent-infant attachment bond is important in terms of mental health and infancy is a crucial time for brain development. It is vital that babies and their parents are supported during this time to promote that attachment for better mental health. Without a good initial bond, children are less likely to grow up, to become happy, independent, and resilient adults. Attachment is an emotional need. It is an experience that creates pathways of emotional learning and communication that lead to the structure of personality and mental health and the development and individuation of the self. Attachment is a trust experience. As one attaches to and relates to the significant other right from birth, attachment and trust are inseparable for the individual child to develop strong personality. Throughout our lives, we are always in attachment with others. We are always in relationship with others and we are always with trust issues. Attachment and trust are lifelong experiences. Trust is learned right from infancy, and relating is learned right from infancy as well. And with trust comes a sense of belongingness and a sense of identity. 
Belongingness is right learned right from infancy and no man can survive alone no man is an island to feel that belongingness we need to perceive our immediate environment our significant others our father mother that caregiver and the world are safe so that we can be able to develop trust and without firm trust, belongingness will be shaky and separation anxiety can occur. Trust is fractured for children when they have to go through horrendous experiences. Where the child learns that the world and, and the people in it cannot be trusted, that the world is not safe and the world is not friendly. So without trust, attachment isn't secure. And when attachment is not secure, emotional development of that child can be stunted. And most of us have been stunted because of what we went through as children. Emotional learning is learning through attachment with another. And that belongingness, enables the child to develop a secure attachment to the significant other, be it a father, a mother, or a, or a caregiver. How does this child learn to trust and not to trust? All learning at this stage is emotional learning. Emotional learning. Children can learn through emotions. And they can learn to love and relate and can learn to belong and they can learn to trust. And all this learning is taking place in the emotional soup between the child and the significant other. The interaction between the mother and the infant is an emotional dance. As the mother mirrors back to the child who the child is, and every time a mother changes the movement of the dance, the baby also changes the emotional tune. This dance is an emotional interaction. It is a bonding of feelings which enables the infant to learn as he or she reads the emotion of the mother that leads to emotional development and identity. How does the child read the mother's emotions? The infant at two weeks recognizes the mother's face, and this is face recognition. Our whole lives, right now as we are listening to this presentation, are dances with other people and their emotions, and we are learning. The infant of two weeks is already learning. That's how we learn interpersonal learning and develop personality. And personality develops from bonding and belongingness. And that's how we develop empathy. And we can have empathy, we cannot have empathy unless we have bonded. And empathy is reciprocal learning. We develop as we tune into the emotional dance with this parent who is offering us that emotional attachment. As the child reads the emotional state of the mother, the child can become secure to learn. Security is paramount. There is no relationship without security. There is no relationship without security. And there is no attachment without security. There is no learning without security. All children first learn by emotional learning, which takes place in the pleasure pathway through attachment. And this attachment is strengthened or is fractured in the amygdala, that center of emotional learning, 
which is a conditioned type of learning compared to and the unconditional type of learning where we accept children unconditionally. And we are able to have well-being and to have mental well-being if we have learned to be feel safe and to feel a sense of belonging with our significant others. Now, maternal bond is essential for the mother and infant, not only for the infant. When we get to the second topic of our day, we are looking at the possible, is it possible to bond with a child who is not ours? That is topic number two. Is it possible to bond with this child who is not our biological child? And yes, it is. We may have wondered if it's really possible to love a child that was not born to us and does not share our genes. And many of us worry that we will not be able to love an adopted child, that we will not be able to love an adopted child as much as a biological child. Motherhood is a journey of the heart, not just of the body. The most important thing a mother can do to love her child is to make sure that they give him all they have from the heart. When we go to the third topic, it is about the science of parental love and love reciprocation. Parental love and love reciprocation. Research has linked mother-child bonding to the hormone oxytocin. And this hormone oxytocin helps motivate mothers to take care of children. Newborns are helpless and they rely on their parents for survival. Mothers must be highly motivated to take care of the infants. A mother must figure out if her infant is hungry, tired and comfortable or lonely so as to provide the appropriate care. This oxytocin is a hormone released by the pituitary gland that stimulates the release of chemical messengers in the heart. This oxytocin is a bonding hormone and it is involved in social interaction and bonding in mammals, including humans. Mothers and fathers' behavior can also have a substantial impact on the children's developing oxytocin systems within themselves. Oxytocin is involved in early social, perceptual, cognitive processes, and it influences complex social behaviors. There are those transcendent moments of parenthood. When we watch our child and we are gripped with an overwhelming love for them and our eyes fill with tears, that heart swelling love, it feels hardwired. That parental love is biologically designed and the physiological basis for this intense love parent feelings towards their children. It's a psychological basis that includes a bundle of nerves in the chest called the vagus nerve, which enables communication and connection. And this chemical known as oxytocin, which generates feelings of trust and nurturant behavior, and it's parts of the brain of the frontal lobe. It is possible for the chemical physiological bond between a parent and a child to be nurtured or to be broken. 
it is possible to further develop or enhance physiological connections. There are certain behaviors that make oxytocin to be produced so that that bonding, emotional attachment can happen between a mother and a child. And these behaviors include things like a mutual gaze, playful and cooing vocalizations, hoo 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 cha mama, that contagious laughter, the skin to skin contact, the touch ranging from tickling to hugging and napping on the chest. Those thousing behaviors. And these behaviors form our connection to these children. And the more of this language we practice, the stronger the connection between a parent and a child becomes. Through these behaviors, the physiological of love is enacted. And this activates the vagus nerve and it enables strong growth and bonding within the brain and the central nervous system of the child and the mother and the parent and the father and the caregiver or the matron or the teacher at school. In addition to shaping the child's brain, mother's love has an effect on her child's ability to love throughout life. Children who have been starved of affection and bonding will have issues in later life when they are not able to express love to their partners. The child's first relationship, the one with the mother, permanently molds the child's capacities to enter into all later emotional relationships. And the first months of a child is a time when events are imprinted in the child's nervous system. Right from the fourth month, when they are still in the mother's womb, they feel the emotional attachment through the waters of the mother. Are we beginning to see what we can do as parents to create more emotional dance between ourselves and the children so that our children can have better emotional and mental well-being? When we get to our fourth topic, love bond between child and non-biological mother. Love bond between a child and a non-biological mother is our fourth topic. And I dedicate this topic to all the matrons, to all the teachers, to all male and female members of society who are blessed to meet these children on a daily basis. Mothers who are less responsive to their children secrete less dopamine, dopamine when watching their children. The brains of children develop at a higher level when their mother, their teacher, or their matron do a better job at caring for them. And this teacher, this mother, this caregiver, this matron also benefits from this caregiving. Because when we are providing that caregiving, dopamine is not only released in our systems, but also in the children's systems. The children benefit and we also benefit. So this feel-good brain chemical called dopamine plays a very crucial role in the development of a healthy bond between a mother and a caregiver. 
this dopamine may motivate the moms to do more for their children because it makes the mothers feel better. And this dopamine is key to bonding between mothers and infants. Oxytocin is also essential during birth because it stimulates contractions. And it is also important during lactation because it stimulates the milk ejection reflex. Oxytocin is part of a complex hormonal balance and a sudden release of oxytocin creates a nudge towards loving. Are we ready to give that nurturance that our children need? During birth, there is an increase of another chemical known as endorphins in the fetus so that the moments following birth, both mother and the baby are under the effects of the opiates because endorphins are painkillers. And there is a lot of pain involved in child bathing. If it wasn't for the help of these endorphins, mothers would die of pain. But these endorphins are good chemicals that help reduce the pain of bathing. Getting to our fifth point, the fifth topic has to do with the power of touch for the baby. Babies have a biological need for close physical affection. Nothing is more important to their emotional, physical, intellectual development than a cuddle or a loving touch. Babies who are cuddled, stroked, and caressed are more likely to grow up to be loving social beings, gain independence, be confident, and this leads to an important milestone by the end of their first year, which is the ability to play alone. Babies who are regularly held and touched gain weight faster. They develop stronger immune systems. And they crawl and walk sooner. And they sleep more soundly and cry less than babies deprived of close physical contact. Children given plenty of physical affection show more task-oriented behavior and less solitary play and less aggression. They also achieve higher levels of educational qualifications in later life. I hope dear parents, matrons, teachers and caregivers are beginning to understand why it is important for a baby to feel touched. Those infants that are deprived of, of touch become lonely, they become isolated and troublesome children. They might get emotional disturbances, might develop hyperactivity and aggressive behavior and conduct disorder problems. And where sexual abuse has become a growing concern, some parents may avoid any form of intimate care for their kids. Touch is the last sensory system to fade 
as we grow older. However, the elderly, like myself here, still need touch as much as we did when we were still young. Without touch, we may feel disconnected, isolated, lonely, and unfulfilled. I'm sure each one of us listening here right now, we have that 60 year, 70 year old or 80 year old mother or grandmother or relative that we are close to. Touch is, stimulation is vital for communication and it is vital for healthy functioning of the brain and hormonal balance of the body and for physical and emotional well-being. All that is about mental health. It is also an essential part of being loved and feeling deserving of affection. Touch is necessary for human development. And lack of touch damages not only individuals, but our whole society and our whole nations. Human touch and love is essential for health. A lack of stimulus and touch very early on causes the stress hormone cortisol to be released, which creates the toxic brain environment and can damage certain brain structures. Sensory deprivation results in behavior abnormalities such as depression, impulse discontrol, violence, substance abuse, and impaired immunological functioning in mother deprived infants. For over a million years, babies have enjoyed almost constant in arms contact with their mothers or other caregivers. And usually members of an extended family receiving constant touch from the first year or so of life. During critical periods of development following birth, the infant's brain is undergoing growth of neural connections. Those synaptic connections in the cortex continue to proliferate for about two years when they peak. And during this period, one of the most crucial things to survive and to be healthy is development of touch. Mammals know this instinctively. And we also are meant to know it instinctively. Newborns are born expecting to be held, to be handled, to be cuddled, to be rubbed, to be kissed, and maybe even licked the way you see a dog licking its baby. All mammals lick their newborns vigorously during the first hour to activate their sensory nerve endings, activating the sensory nerve endings, which are involved in motor movements and visual orientation so that our children can grow at the rate at which they are supposed to grow. Crawl, talk, and use their muscles at the rate at which they are supposed to be doing that. These nerve endings cannot be activated until after birth due to the insulation of the watery womb environment in which this child grows. So lack of love changes the chemicals in the brain and can eventually change the structure of that brain. When a child is born, breastfeeding neatly brings together nourishment for the baby with the need for closeness shared by the mother and the child. And this is a crucial way of nurturing the child's brain. I am sure most fathers feel left out 
when they watch their wives breastfeeding the child and the baby and the mother are sharing that emotional dance as the mother is looking into the eyes of the child and the child is looking into the eyes of the mother and the mother is smiling into the child and the child is smiling back to the mother and there is that bonding that energy that is so strong and the father who is standing nearby can feel left out and can feel envious. But fathers, you can take advantage of this. As your wife is breastfeeding the child, get closer to them. You can either rub your wife's back as she is breastfeeding, and at the same time, with the other hand, rub the back of the child as she is receiving that breast so that you can be part of that emotional dance. And it is this emotional dance that gives that security, that gives that sense of belonging, that gives that sense of identity to this child. Now, for these mothers, who are not biological mothers, and you have to feed this child either through a bottle or by any other means, this emotional child. Give that presence to that child. Look into their eyes. Smile at them. That emotional dance is the development of mental health well-being for this child later on in future and at the same time it is also stimulating that dopamine and that oxytocin within your own system so that your mental health also becomes better have you ever wondered why when we get back home from a stressful day at work and we get home and you cuddle your child, you feel that stress level, those cortisol levels turning down? Because this oxytocin and this dopamine cannot exist together with oxytocin. The moment oxytocin enters and dopamine come on board, cortisol stress hormone dissipates and unplugs. Are we ready to rewire and rebuild and rehabilitate our own mental health and the mental health of our children by redeveloping this emotional dance between ourselves and our children? Children belong to the heavens and the nations. Let's look at the last slide and go through it together as we end this presentation. Slide 21. Children belong to the heavens and to the nations. Will we choose to nurture both our biological children and these little angels we cross paths with that are meant to be part of our mission on this physical earth while we are in these physical bodies? Every child matters. Every child deserves bonding and attachment. Every child has a right to holistic health. Every child has a right to physical, social, emotional, mental, and spiritual well being. Are we ready to parent and to foster? mentally healthy future citizens of our nation? And let 
ensuring mental health for all children be our service to humanity? I now invite you to close your eyes gently. Look back at yourself when you are still that child. Look at that significant other who was there with you. Was it your mother? Was it your father? Was it your aunt? Was it that matron? Was it that teacher? Who shared with you that emotional dance that gave you that sense of trust, that sense of belonging, that sense of secure attachment that has made you the person you are right now, mentally healthy? Or was there ever that person, apart from your real parent, who was meant to nurture you, but ended up abusing you and you lost sense of trust, you saw the world as unfriendly, unsafe, and not to be trusted, that you have grown up craving for intimacy, but fearing closeness, which must have impacted your mental well-being. It is time to heal all that. Taking this breath of life deeply into your lungs, visualize a ray of golden light healing all that as it goes into your nervous system creating new neural pathways, new neural connections and new synapses so that you can have a chance to visualize that second chance parent who can give you that emotional dance that can give you that emotional well-being. Allow this oxytocin hormone that you are receiving because of this emotional dance to circulate into every cell of your body. Feel it vibrating within you. Feel yourself bonding to your own self. Feel yourself bonding to all people in the world. All life in the universe. Bonding to nature, bonding to create a source. Feel one with everything. This is what gives us secure attachment so that we can develop healthy mental well-being. When you are ready, gently open your eyes. Rub your hands together. Wipe them over your face and be ready to start a new life of emotional dance with nature, with fellow human beings, so that we can remain mentally healthy. Thank you so much for listening. Have a blessed day and a blessed week and a blessed year till we meet again next year for another remembrance of Mental Health Week. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for such a nice and divine presentation. And it is truly needed in today's world that uh, we are not just body, uh, we are a spirit, and we should like to treat everyone, especially in parenting, uh, our child uh, like a piece of God. So uh, thank you so much for uh, enlightening us uh, this knowledge in our society, which is too much needed in present time.
uh, before winding up uh, this uh, divine session i just want to ask a conclude message uh, from your side to hold the world and humanity uh, through this uh, international conference my message is one let us love every child as a child of the heavens as a child of the universe as a child of each nation so that we can nurture these children to have that sense of security to have that sense of belonging and identity to feel they trust the world in which they are while they are still in their physical bodies so that we can create a possibility of better mental health for our children thank you so much thank you <laughs>